Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. How are you all doing? Surviving the snow? Yes, I hope. My name is Tara Aisha Willis. I'm Associate Curator in Performance and Public Practice here at the MCA. I really appreciate you all joining us for Angel Bat Dawid, amazing, amazing Chicago artist. Uh, tonight, we're gonna be hearing uh, some about what improvisation is for her. She's gonna be trying out a new practice on us tonight, a new version of um, her typical concert. Um, and so I'm really excited to see what she has in store for us. Uh, this evening is part of the In Progress series here at the museum. This is a series of programs, usually on Tuesday nights, that are almost always in the commons, but not always in the commons. They're designed to give artists, specifically Chicago artists for the most part, as well as other thinkers and curators even, a platform for developing new works. And they're also designed to give you all a glimpse into that artist's creative process while they're working on something new. Um, one of the things I love about this format is that after the artist shares what they're working on, we engage in a post-show conversation post-show, whatever that's, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, but one thing we like to try out at the top of those conversations is a reverse Q&A. So what I will do, I'll be chatting with Angel for a bit, but I will also try to sneak in a couple of questions for you all so that the artist gets some feedback from you. So think about what you're experiencing as you experience it so that you're ready to give her those thoughts because she's really working on a new idea here tonight for you guys. Um, and without further ado, Angel Bat Dawid. Enjoy. Thank you. 
the sound of joy is enlightenment. A space fire truth is enlightenment, is enlightenment, space fire. Oh, sometimes it's music, strange mathematics. <laughs>
into the deep, deep pain. Don't look away from it! Don't look away from him! Look at it! Look at the disgusting filth! The mess we have made your face! Why? We gotta love, we gotta love each other more. We gotta be in community. We gotta sing whenever you feel like it. Try one day of just singing to people. How are you today? How are you doing? A pleasure to meet you. Welcome, welcome to my space. Whoa. You know why we must do this? We have to be an example! To this one, to this one, we have to lead by example! If you want them to love, we have to love! This should be normal! This should be normal! Can look. Let me show you how beautiful it is. It's so beautiful. Look at it. Look at this beauty. The African look how beautiful it is. It is all being good to you. You better get yourself a rose. <laughs> you better get yourself some rose I'm golden braided slippers too I want you to ride to a coast for the sun back You need to look with your Quran Because he taught us that the African look Is wholesome It's so beautiful. The African look is only good to you. You better get yourself a rose and golden, golden, golden braided, golden, golden braided, golden braided, golden braided.
So I just want to say gratitude for, you know, like Sign of Family Stone said, thank you for letting me be myself. Thank you, every single one of y'all. But what I want us to do, if you can join me, you know, because this isn't entertainment. This is entertainment. Okay? We ain't entertained nobody up in here. This is entertainment. Okay? So we're going to take a deep breath. And then... When you exhale, just let out a tone. We're gonna send out this powerful tone to make this world a better place. This is where it starts. It starts in community. It starts by singing and coming together. All right, let's take a deep breath. to the edge here, kind of. I mean, not everybody will be able to look in the eye, but yeah, just kind of in the circle rather than, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm part of it. Right, exactly. Thank you. What's on your mind, Angel? Oh, after these things, I just feel whole and I feel complete. Yeah. I think you're not the only one. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing everything with us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to maybe start with you just telling, because we've had a beautiful phone call mm. about this. Um, could you start us off by saying, what's new about this for you? What did you try tonight that you haven't tried before? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think... Anytime I do this, it's always going to be something new. Mm -hmm. um, I am a part of the free jazz community, which is where I really learn how to really express myself. I was classically trained, and I was always stuck to the page. And I always never felt complete as a musician because I couldn't just play anything. And when I started going to free jazz jam sessions here in Chicago, it just opened up everything for me. And so going back to what you're saying with improvisation, which is huge in the free jazz community, you just, you know, there'll be, sometimes I'll have shows where I just met someone for two minutes and then we go out and play together. I don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> and um, I, didn't, I didn't know where this was gonna go. Um, like my practice is very much like I have a map, but it's just a map because we may detour and go somewhere else in that original map, because really, you can't really uh, control time. I don't know what's gonna happen a second from now. Like, I, every, every, everything is new. 
Um, but what it does inform it informs me of uh, I just get stronger at it. You know, everything that we do is a practice. You know, so it's like the more you do something, um, the more solid you get in it, the more solid you feel about the work that you're producing. So I I try to perform as much as possible. That's a practice too. Like as a musician, like you want to have your daily personal practice where you're practicing your scales and things like that. You also want to have a daily listening practice. You know, like I, I'm obsessed with records, a lot of records. So like, you know, that's where I get a lot of my compositional ideas is listening to the music that I play. And then third of all, you want the practice of performance. So, I mean, it can get tricky because people are like, oh, you got to, you know, you got to get paid and all that kind of stuff, which, yes, you do. But there's also this thing of, like, if somebody asks me to play, I'm probably going to say yes because I need that everyday practice of, of, you know, these type of settings. Have you practiced performing with the audience around you on all sides very much? Yes. A that's lot? Just, yeah. That's, that's how just, you like it. Well, okay. Here's, <laughs> here's what it is. There's, 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 there's different types of performance. There's presentational performances, which is what the world is usually used to. You have a performer, and you guys sit and spectate. That's cool. But there's also participatory presentation, and that's uh, more ancient. It's more African, for sure. You can see it a lot in our churches. Um, in the black church, if the pastor says something you like, you can be like, well, amen. Like, no one's going to, and it'll be supported, you know. Um, I, I know y'all saw me go through a lot of things, but, you know, because I um I grew up in the church, and I come from ministers, and we used to, uh, my dad was a young preacher in Georgia, like in the 70s. He was like, you know, in his 20s, and he was going to these old churches in the backwoods of Georgia, you know, where the elders are all in their 90s and 80s. So if you think about an elder in their 90s, in the 70s, that elder probably was a slave or had slave parents or grew up with his parents being slaves. So there was a lot of songs um, and traditions that I witnessed as a little kid that I saw them do. Like, they would do these songs and go into these, I can't even really describe it. We go in, yeah, no, we go into something as black people. Um, it's a thing. And um, it doesn't matter really what the religion is. You know, like, all we have was Christianity, so we put all of our, you know, our ancient African things in that. So you can't really ignore... Uh, some of those practices, because that's a big work. One of my biggest things with my work is investigating the spirituals, you know, because it was in these settings, um, you know, this is a Hush Harbor service, which I can tell you, this is what it is. So uh, Hush Harbors, um, by our enslaved ancestors would go in the woods in the middle of the night, and they would have services. Now, they could die for this. What would make these people risk their lives every night to go out into the woods and have a jam session? It was in these jam sessions that you get the spirituals. They weren't just songs to tell us to get up north. Mm -mm. We weren't even really talking about north. Come on. We were steeper than that. We knew that there was a land that's not built by human hands. Like, there's another consciousness, like a higher consciousness, which they had to do because this was ridiculous. This was, like, ridiculous. You know what I mean? We ought to be ashamed of ourselves that that's in our history books, that that's what we teach in our kids. What? And it's, and it's still going on? So, you know, with my work and the music that I do, I was like, okay, well, if Hush Harbor's worked in the past, and they must work today, too. But this time, I'm not going in secret. Meaning if I feel like speaking in tongues and it comes on me, I'm doing it in public because I'm not ashamed of it. If I get slain in the spirit, I'm slain. I'm not reserving it just for church and on Sunday or the mosque that you go to or wherever you go. I'm not reserving it for them temples. We scream and we holler and we shout and that God is through. That God is through. I feel my ancestors won't even let me sleep at night. they be like, Angel, why are you always talking about these blackness all the time? I was like, because they keep me up. They still upset. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm very, very grateful that I could do something this intimate 
at a weird institution. I'm, I'm, let, me, let me explain weird, all right? I'm not dissing no one. I'm just talking about this whole infrastructure. Weird is Western, educated, industrialized, rich democracy that it's weird. And we've all agreed to it. There's some great things about it. You know what I mean? But most of the time, it's weird. This should not be unusual for me to express myself or people be afraid of these things, especially in our African culture. There's a great book by Eileen Southern. It's a hard to get book. It's kind of out of print. But this sister, she was a scholar back in the 70s, and she did all this research on black American music. She starts from the very beginning. Wasn't no YouTube and Wikipedia there. That means that this sister had to go to the libraries, dig in, dust off stuff, and it's quite exhaustive, but it's so good. But the first chapter is about music in Africa. And um, because African music was mostly oral, the only records they have are like some um, white explorers who came to Africa like in the 1600s. Their description was like, it was like music all day. Like they would have like five bands play. They would get tired and five more bands would come up and play. It was like, there was even a case where people had to sing. Like if you went to court, you had to sing your case. I mean, like, so you're talking about my ancestors coming from that, where music wasn't entertainment, it was life. You had cooking songs, working songs, you know, um, songs to get up in the morning, songs to go to deaths, funeral songs. It was like the whole world was music. It was like music was actually the currency, you know? So you take people who live in that culture, and then you strip them away to a culture where you can't do nothing. <laughs> we had to go in the woods. And then out of that, came those spirituals. And from the spirituals, you get jazz, blues, hip hop, gospel, or all the great black music comes from the spirituals. Trust me. And so I'm like, okay, here I am in 2020. And there's still, things still ain't right. We got to go back into the Hush Harbors. That's it. I love that you said you want to do Hush Harbors without having to be hushed, right? Yeah. Yeah! <laughs> See? <laughs> and then you also talked about the institution that we're in, right? And so, of course, in this literal space, this room, there's certain things, like certain materials, certain things that you couldn't do, that you would have liked to be able to do. So I want to know, what would you do if there were no constraints? What would be the totally public, not hushed, hushed harbor? <laughs> there would be a lot more incense in here. And there would definitely be real candles. It would be a lot more incense. Um, I would probably um, not, I, it would probably be a little bit more open, more pillows on the ground. Like I, I would really love people to feel comfortable like if they wanted to like lay down or be in any position that's comfortable for them. You know, and have seats. And some people don't want to get involved too. So you don't have to. But, um, you know, in the community that I'm in, I'm in a very rich, wonderful music community. Us in this free jazz realm. Um, we all, people, what you doing? Come through, you want to jam? Yeah, like we, we'll go over and jam uh, weekly with each other. That's another practice. You want to jam regularly with people. Playing with others is important. I do just solo stuff, but I have a seven-piece band. And we just do, like, if it's just me times six. <laughs> and then I don't, you know, we have songs, but um, these brothers, my brotherhood, they will go and do whatever, and it always works. And then they'll go into a thing, and you'll be like, ooh, that's a new song. Because you know, that's another thing. I'm a composer. And um, doing these things, I heard all sorts of compositional ideas. I'm like, ooh, let me remember that in my brain. Because here's the thing. Your brain is the first recorder. We're always like, where's my phone so I can record? I said, like, record it here. Like, I tried this experiment. My phone had died. You see, I, I'd just been on European tour, but so I was with my brothers. All my brothers, we was in Europe cutting up, cutting up. And um, I, my phone had died, and I'd walked into this cathedral. It was like this, this big old talk about institution. And then I heard this melody in my head. I'm like, man. I was like, you know what? I'm going to use the original recorder and write this. I went to my brothers. So I was like, y'all, I got this melody in my head. Can y'all all just memorize it right now? They're like, OK, cool. So now they know it. I know it. You know. So it's like with this technological age that we live in, uh, which is great, um, if we don't be careful, they will control us. See, the robots the androids, the eyes, they're not human, okay? And we have to always remember that. So they give us whatever we want. Oh, you guys want this? Here, here, here. That's great. 
but they don't know that we have to be together sometimes. You know, they don't know that we have to, you know, eat food together or breathe the same air, touch each other, you know, look at each other. Like, that's, we need that human bonding. And if we don't be careful, um, we're going to have to be more intentional. That's the word. You're going to have to be more intentional about making that happen. You know, people are like, I don't have time. You have to make time. You have to make time. Hey, call your friends. Hey, come through. What are we going to do? I don't know. Let's just eat some food and hum together. I, I, you know, like, this is also an example. That's why I'm glad there's children here. So I want them to see the example of, like, hey, I used to do this when I was a kid. We used to be like, we'd turn the video games off, and we would make up a skit. And then we would do it at church. You know, like, we, we always had those spaces where we could do that. And then look at me now. I'm still doing it. That's all I'm doing, you know. Um, but I think that's how I grew so much as a person, learning in those things. And that's where you feel ultimate love and human bonding. We're going to have to be way more intentional about it. Way more. On that note, I have a question for the audience. Very simple question. How did you feel watching the performance? We have a mic that will run around. I think there's someone right here in front. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, thank you, thank you, Angel. And I felt immediately welcomed in. I also, though, felt trepidation uh, when people weren't responding how I was responding. I felt called into a call and response sort of impulse also growing up in the church and felt that I couldn't do that here. Um, so that is to say I felt extremely welcomed by you but also extremely constrained by the sort of institutional setting. Um, and also just had a lot of questions about your relationship with reed instruments and how they sort of channel the human voice, but that can be a question for later. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that is deep. You said a whole bunch of deep things. Everything you said, yes. Um, yeah. Anyone else want to share? We can come back to things as well later, but... How did you feel watching the performance or experiencing the performance? I felt at times I was experiencing it firsthand, but also through the reactions of the rest of the audience, right? Um, this space, my friend Madeline, uh, we're from very... We're from the same space, but very different spaces at the same time because I'm president of the DuSable Museum of African American History. Dr. Margaret Burroughs. Yes, Margaret I wrote a Burroughs, song. Margaret. I wrote a song about her mm. poem. What should I tell my children? Are black who are black. That's right. That's I right. Love Dr. Margaret. So the the idea that I'm here with my counterpart, the president here of MCA, and we're watching you and in this space, I think is just phenomenal, and I think it's timely. And I think it is intentional, whether it's our intent or the maker's intent, I think it is very intentional that we're having these interactions today when many of us are under existential threat and when there's such a lack of human interaction. And I also am glad to see the children here, and she's about the age of my oldest granddaughter. And, and to have children draw children into these types of interactive, artistic, musical experiences without electronics is maybe more necessary than we know or too soon, right? So thank you. Thank you. And thank you, thank you to the MCA. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I felt deeply grateful for you voicing emotions in ways that are not felt publicly and live, um, almost at all. You know, the grieving, the sound of wailing, the laughter, like the power of it, I could feel it in my body. And it's just not something we get, you know, really access to, and it takes a lot of strength and courage, so thank you, because I was so happy. Even, I mean, I was really also on the brink of tears, but overall I was just couldn't stop smiling because it was like, yes, <laughs> thank you. Yay, that's why I do it, you know. Um, 
that's why, you know, that's why people would go to church every Sunday. They're like, just to get me through the week. Woo! You know, this was like every, su- like this times 100 was like the best music you'd have ever heard in the world with the best band. Like, for real, go to just some, go to a random black church on the south side. You are going to hear some of the best musicians in the world every Sunday for free. I have a good time, but I learned, uh, you know, it's just that spirit of uh, music that's going all the way back, like I said, and I'm glad that you felt that because, you know, I do express the hard things, too. We got to talk about it, you know, but it, what I notice is that even though I talk about a lot of hard things, I notice at the end of every show, there's never people who are like, I hate you, Angel. They're always like, thank you. They're like, how, you, know, you know, so I'm like, well, this must be. He, this must be how we do it, you know, because I think at the end of the day, I think y'all feel like it's all love. Like, I'm not coming from a place to make people feel bad. I'm telling you what I'm going through. And I had to learn to personally do that in my life. Let people know what you're going through. All right. Because then you give them a chance to be your friend. You know, like if someone comes to me and they're like, Angel, I don't like when you do that to me. Then that helps me to know about them and be like, oh, and I'm not going to do it. If you're really a good friend, you're not going to do it. If you aren't a good friend, then I don't need to be mess with you anyway. Bye. You know, so it's good to do that. So I'm glad you felt that way because that's really what I would want everyone to walk away feeling. Love. Uh, oh, man. Oh, wow. Oh, Angel. <laughs> I no, did. I, I, so I just, I, and then I saw just sort of right in my mind, it, it says humans are natural collectors right over there. And that just, that struck instantly because, yeah, because, yeah, like, I, it seems like something like this, that you've, 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 collect, you've collected so much, like you've collected it up here on a phone, on everything. There's so, there's so much that's come, that's come into forms like this that, the, that you're, that you're, you know, now holding just as an artist in person all the time. And then in something like this, it's like you're giving it to all of us and giving it to everybody. And we're all just sort of like, wow, like, you know, don't, don't know, like, you give us this thing. It's just like, wow, what is this? Like, you picked up, you were walking through your map and you picked up something. It's like, what is this? And sometimes it's just like, I don't know what to do with this. And they're like, Angel, Angel what do you want me to do with, it, with this thing that you just gave me? <laughs> and it just, it, it brings, it brings up, a, it brings up so, like, so much, and there's just like a lot of, a lot of, a lot of wonder, and I don't know. Yeah, you and person, and you t- you you show people that you can give things and give them back because we're always so we're so always been taught to just sort of like hold on to things, hold on to these things that you find, but you give them back. And I think there's a lot of it in the performance where I'm just sort of like, oh my god, how can I give this back to you? Is the course of you giving it to me in this performance? It's just like I'm, you know, I'm, 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 it, we're clamped just by talking so much. So thank you. Thanks, Ben. He's part of the music community I'm telling you about. Mm-hmm. Like we jam all the time. Mm-hmm. We jam, yeah. When you jam with someone, it's like music is a language. You know, it's you may not know someone personally very well, but once you jam with someone, you be like, mm-hmm. we know each other. Angel, you mentioned jam sessions when you were talking about Hush Harbors, actually, yeah. which was really great. <laughs> like this comparison of something that happened before the phrase jam session existed, you know, as a jam session. Like thinking of this um, sort of black church space, self-made black church space as a jam session. So this is maybe not related to that, but I'm curious what it feels like to you to perform this. Like, how are you making choices in the moment? What does that feel like physically almost or emotionally or um, mental, whatever, you know, not that those are all separate, but, um, and, and because you are someone who jams all the time with other musicians, being by yourself, like, does it feel like you're jamming with the room? Does it feel like you're jamming with ancestors, combination of all of these things and five other things? Like, what does it feel like? Um, it's a lot. Um, I have to do a lot of preparation beforehand on a spiritual level. I don't just walk up in here. Nope. Mm-mm. I've been praying about this all week. I don't do any show without like spiritual preparation. You know, like it's it's not a on off switch, and so um, that takes a lot of self discipline. You know, you have to I have to be disciplined with knowing myself. Um, lots of meditation and um, you know making sure I stay positive. 
you know, um, because I want to be as authentic as I possibly can. I'm always about being authentically myself. I fight very hard for that. And it's with the hopes of that it would encourage everyone to do the same, is to be authentically yourself. Um, and so when I'm performing, that's all I'm doing, you know? So like if my hand, like, okay, I want to play a note, but my hand's like, no, we want to play this. I'm like, oh, okay, well. You know, like I just accept where things are, you know, and I learned that in the free jazz community, you know, because, um, you know, I would go to these jam sessions and they would just throw you on stage with somebody and you would just play. You don't know what's going to happen, so you have to own everything. So, you know, the creation story where God created humans, in that story, the deity said he would create something and he would say, that's good. I like that. That's what you have to do with your art. You have to bless it. You know? So, like, if I come on stage and I fall out, I didn't have no plan to fall out. I could have all these insecurities. Ooh, do I look stupid? Uh, no. Mm -mm. I bless that because that's my artistic expression right now. You know, we have to get in the habit of blessing our work and saying that's good. It's interesting in that story <laughs> that the only thing the deity said wasn't good was that man should be alone. It's not good for us to be alone. It's good for us to be in relationships with each other, you know? So in the process of improv I just bless everything I do, and I own it. And I'm like, who's going to tell me otherwise? You know, somebody say, I hated that. I'm like, okay, that's, that's okay. It's not about people liking it. That's like the wrong question. It's not about if you like it or hate it. It's just like I'm just in an experience right now, and I'm going to keep experiencing this, whether I'm on stage or whether nobody knew me or if I, I'm just going to keep doing this. <laughs> Anyone else want to share how they felt, what they sensed, heard, saw, experienced before we open it up for more quest like questions for Angel? Any other things to throw into the room, give her some feedback? Oh, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say keep in flight. my brother. That's my brother right there. Uh, hi, Angel. <laughs> Over here. Hey! <laughs> How's it going? Uh, I just wanted to say that I felt very, um, might be even selfish to say, but I felt very jealous of you while you were performing because I feel like I really saw you, you know, and you were in such a vulnerable place in front of everybody, and I feel like that's just so hard for people to do it's something that I certainly struggle with I'm like nervous talking in front of the room of people right now but I just felt like I really wanted to share that with you that I think that's very special and um important to put out into the world so I just wanted to thank you for for that what makes it hard <laughs> it's a, I don't know it's just um easy to question yourself you know to not bless the decisions that you make you know to hold back or overthink or stumble you know I'm going to encourage you right now let me tell you about human behavior habits there's not bad people there's bad habits you know what I mean so like it just has to be a habit you know so at first it's not going to be easy to be this vulnerable it's not but just like when you were learning how to read, you weren't, you were like C A T. And now you can be like cat, you know? It's the same way. Whatever you repeat, it's what you're gonna be. And when I had that revelation, it just made it like less personal, you know? Just like, oh, I just need to start repeating this over and over and over again. You can start slow. Like, just think, like, what if I just take this moment right now and just. I don't know, skip down the street. No one's watching. Let me just do it. You know? Take baby steps. 
you know? And then, you know, just do something like that you would do when you were a kid that you love. You know, like if you like the jump rope or something, just do it. And then take it, it's okay, get in the habit of that. And then what if I just go outside in the park and do it by myself? You know, like just, and when you make the things a habit, because that's the only reason, that's how I learned all these instruments. I wasn't no prodigy. No. I, I wanted to play piano so bad. And my sister was killing it. And then she was just going in. And I was just like, oh, how's she killing it? I had to sit there and learn all my scales. I had to learn all the scales. And it wasn't easy. I had so many insecurities about myself. Oh, my gosh. Just about my performance. Just about who oh, I was so insecure. And I just realized one day, I'm not living a life like that. And I had to get in the habit of changing my thoughts. It was a habit, and it's still a habit, you know? Like, you can just be like, I'm not thinking that. You control your thoughts, not the other way around. You tell your thoughts, no, this is who I am. Now go and do my bidding. <laughs> not your thoughts saying, you suck, you ain't, you're an idiot, you stupid. Uh-uh, we don't work like that. No, mm -mm. you do what I say. <laughs> At first, it's not easy. But, I mean, just like I said, it's all baby steps. Literally baby steps. You weren't walking when you came out the womb. Human beings, we repeat things and then we know it. So we've repeated institutionalized racism for way too long. It's a bad habit. So we have to break out of it, you know, and it's going to take time. It's 400 years. It's a long time. Or longer. It's a long time. Mm -hmm. Angel, what's your next baby step? Or what do you, as an artist, like what do you want to be getting into the habit of next? Well, <laughs> because I got in the habit of learning how to manifest whatever I choose in my life, I was like, dang, this is working on my personal life like crazy. What's the biggest thing I could wish for? Y'all, it's crazy. I don't think I can even share it with you. It's too big. Okay, that's it's like huge. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's like, okay, if it worked for that, then maybe it'll work for that. You know, there's there's things that I would like to see in the future. In fact, I put it out there that I'm going to live to be at least 200 years. You know why? Because I want to see two generations go by. And also, yeah, what? I said at least 200. <laughs> at least 200. That's right. They live. You know, like we can be. And also, you guys are all invited to my 200th birthday party, so stick around. It's probably going to be on Pluto or Neptune or something. Um, but, you know, just like I do want to see what happens in the world, you know. Um, see, back in the day, people had matriarchs and patriarchs that lived that long, and communities had that so that the youth could have someone. Now, if I'm 200 years and there's some kids around, then maybe we can go to Mama Angel's house and she'll help us out. And You know, like, so, like, I think of, when I think of big things, I think of like global things. Like I'm like, we don't have to be in this kind of world. No, I'm not doing it. I hate this. I hate it. Hate it. Unacceptable. It is ridiculous. Goodness. I, can't, I mean, like my parents are always watching the news, and I'm like, oh, what a joke. Yeah, so. Do you have any questions for them before we open it, before I hand the mics around to everybody to ask you stuff? <laughs> um, <laughs> last things? Anything you want to know about what people thought, saw, or felt? Um, I guess... Um, I just feel deeply connected. Like, I feel like, you know, a lot of us are strangers here today. We've never seen each other. But, you know, I feel, like, very comfortable around everyone. And I really thank you for that. You know, I'm just in gratitude, really, because, um, yeah, like, my life, I wasn't, like, really accepted, you know, in circles and when I was a kid. So it made it easy for me to be the oddball. I was already odd. <laughs> you know, I couldn't, I couldn't blend in, and I didn't know why. Um, but so it's amazing, you know, like twenty years later that I can be in a space and people take me seriously. You know, 
So, um, you know, a lot of this thing, people think it's a joke or think it's funny or think I'm a gimmick or, you know, a novelty. And uh, just to have people really like this, you know, MCA is an important institution for art. And um, I just can't believe I'm in here being myself. Like, I am totally being myself. <laughs> ah, that must mean I love myself, you know? To be able to uh, have moments like this where I'm around people I don't know. And uh, no one's, like, mad at me. or. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Angel before we finish up? Yeah. Hi, Angel. <laughs> um, it was really fun to watch you uh, watch your hands while you played from this angle, so thank you. Um, I'm curious about the vessels that you have mm -hmm. and the sort of fabrics that you have. Yes, I'm glad you asked that. Um, so at Hush Harbors, is, there's a very little information about them. Like, I'm totally trying to get more research on it. It's hard. I got a few books. There's not a lot online. Um, but one of the books I read, they, they would talk about these elements, like they would go out in the woods. Another reason they call it Hutch or Brush Harbors, they would put like, and it's so crazy that these are already here. I didn't put these here. But they would put, um, make these little shelters for the services. And uh, they would either take a log or a kettle out there with them. And no one really knows why some, you know, because like a lot of our traditions were oral. Um, but, you know, they were speculating that maybe it was a way that, you know, people could scream into the vessel to hold the sound so that they wouldn't be heard. Or they would scream into a log. Um, me taking this bit of fabric and wetting it was just to symbolize that they would also take sheets. And they would put the sheets over to muffle the sound. And so I in some way wanted to just homage, pay homage um, to the little bit of information that I know of because I know that some of those things may be practical things but they also might have a deeper significance that I really want to explore. So. Hi Angel. Hi. Hi. So um, I have a really good friend um, and she's an artist right and she's super talented. Like her art is like really talent, like talented, and um, she puts a lot of like passion and emotion into her art, not only like in her work, but also like in her like personal projects, right? Um, and I think for the most part, like people appreciate her, like see her as this like great talent, but like every once in a while, maybe there's like people in like the corporate world who like don't understand, or maybe they value like professional like communication or whatever higher than like raw talent. Um, so as an artist, I guess, you put so much like emotion into your art and you hope that people appreciate it. But when there's like few people who don't and they should, how does that make you feel and how do you get over that? Well, I guess I think of things a little differently as like, and I mean this in the nicest way, but I don't really care what people think. You know, like, I, I have to be myself, period. You know, like, I have to be me. I don't think there's anything wrong with me. Um, and I feel like, like this is me everywhere, okay? Every part of my life, I don't switch it up. Because there was a time in my life where I switched it up, and that was not working. That switch up, I, could, I, I was dying inside. Um, so for your friend, it sounds like, She's tired of, because I went through the same thing. I, I was working a job, and it was paying me really, really well. But I was miserable because I was like, I'm a musician, I'm a musician. And so um, I had some money saved, and I took that. And I said, I'm going to take a year to be a musician. If I fall on my butt, well, I'll just get another job. I did this in 2014. I'm sitting up here in the MCA right now, huh? Because I made the choice that what I love to do has to be the most important thing for me. You know? That's just it. And I just have to do that. And I would encourage your friend to, you know, it's hard. It's not easy. I didn't do it, like, in one step, you know? I, I did it in baby steps, you know? 
you take it a little bit at a time. Try to break away from the grid. Try to break away from the, you know, the matrix. A little bit at a time if you have to. Some people can do the pick. I didn't. It took me time, you know? Um, but it was worth it. You'll never regret doing something because it was because you love to do it. And then you're not even thinking about no one else. You're just like, I just want to be happy. You know, I just want to be happy and do what I want to do. You know, If it wasn't music, I would do this. You know, Whatever you want to do in life. Whether you're a musician or whether you love to draw or maybe you just want to like have a house in Alaska by yourself, do it. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that performance, Angel. Um, I just have a quick question. Based on you just said, as you were talking about pleasing yourself and not caring what people think. So you're part of more of an arts tradition, I guess for lack of a better word, um, that uh, is challenging, right? Most, most Americans want art or entertainment that just spills onto them and then they walk away. They don't want to be. They don't want to feel challenged when they're watching a performance, even if it's not a participatory. They just don't want to feel challenged by notes that are out of a Western scale or anything like that. So when you and the, the rest of the people you play with and the free jazz movement, ACM, all those people in general, when you guys are doing it, are you really are you doing it just for yourself, or do you think, wait, how can we make this more challenging for our audience too? No, it doesn't go through my head at all. Like, I don't know. Um, I mean, I know it's challenging, but the intention isn't challenging. Um, it's like, how do I explain it? Um, I'm not thinking of that at all. You know, like, I'm really just being myself. And I know that some parts of me may challenge some people, and some parts may not. But, I mean, even in myself, I challenge myself. Um, so it's not like, oh, I don't care about what people think. It's more like I just accept myself. And if, if no one really likes me or accept me, that's okay. No hard feelings. It's all love. Because there's people who I don't accept. <laughs> there's governments I don't accept. I don't like it. They challenge me all the time. Um, but, you know, like we live in this world together, so we have to find some way to be ourselves, and I just really want to, I feel like if we all just be ourselves, no matter what it is, things will work out just fine, you know? Um, but I, I, I haven't thought of that before, and I will give it some thought, though, because um, it, it really isn't me trying to challenge. It's really me being myself. And then there's a difference between improvisation and spontaneous composition. That's another thing, because what happens is when pe we do free jazz, um, there can sometimes be the idea like, oh, they're not real musicians. They're just playing whatever they want. Improvisation is, and I'm quoting Gary Bartz, okay? Gary Bartz, he said improvisation, his definition is, that's when you do something you didn't intend to do that, and then you hook it up and make it wrong, okay? That's improvisation, right? Spontaneous composition is, oh, no, I knew exactly where I'm going, and I knew what scale I'm playing, and I knew I wanted to do these you know, diminish chords going up, and I knew I wanted to do that at the spot, at the moment, you know. Um, and so making that distinction with of this actually being, an, it's really a, a, a skill, not just a, um, you know, uh, what do you call it, like a existential moment I'm having. It, it's, it's both. It's, it's very much professional musicianship, and existential moment at the same time. It's just all together, which is, I feel like, more of a how the world should be. You know, we don't have to dissect things so much. I'm already doing it. Yeah, I know all my scales. Cool. But I don't have to really let you know that I know all of them. I'm just doing them. You know, it doesn't mean I'm not doing the steps, you know? One last question. Sorry to be super insistent about my question, but I just was wondering about your experience as an instrumentalist and why, especially today, you chose the instruments you chose, um, your connection to them, and how they help you um, move through your art. Yes, the clarinet is my best friend. 
Um, I wanted to be a musician ever since I was a little girl. My dad took us to go see Amadeus. So as pro-black as I am, Mozart was my first. Ah! Yeah, <laughs> so I went to go see Amadeus. And there was a scene where he's a little boy, and his father puts, he's playing the harpsichord. I was like, kids can do that? I was just so surprised that, like, a kid could do that. And I was like, oh, wow, I want to do that. But that wasn't it. He just picked them up, blindfolded them, then he played the violin. I was like, what? I was like, oh, I want to do that. And then the music, you know, from the film, it was just, I don't know why. I still have the soundtrack. I listen to it all the time. Um, but, you know, my relation, you know, I lived overseas in Africa. My parents were missionaries, so we lived in Kenya for four years. So it wasn't, I was still like, oh, I want to play music, but there wasn't no piano lesson. As soon as we got back to the States, I was like, piano, I want to learn it, and I want to learn violin. So I got my piano lessons, went to school, orchestra was filled up. And it was like, we don't have no more violins. I'm like, well, what do you have? Because I really want to play an instrument. They're like, well, we have a clarinet. I was like, it looks so goofy to me. I was like, what is this? I was like, well, let me see. I was like, I just wanted to play some. So I went to the library, because again, one no YouTube. <laughs> you know? So I went to the library and I was trying to find like um, clarinet music and all I could find was Benny Goodman, and no offense, but I'm a 12-year-old little black girl. I was like, who is this goofy dude? I couldn't, you know? <laughs> so then guess what I found? Mozart's clarinet concerto. I was like, oh, I love Mozart. <laughs> you know, and so when I heard it, I was like, because the reason why me and my siblings wanted to play instruments because we wanted to be cold. Like, we was watching Fiddler on the Roof, and they were going, we were like, oh, we want to do that. You know, so when I heard the clarinet concerto, I was like, I didn't know the clarinet could do that. I was obsessed. You want to talk about habit. And I didn't realize I was doing this when I was a kid, but I would listen to it in the morning. I would listen to it when I go to bed. I was just like listen to it all the time, all the time. Because I was like, I didn't ever heard a clarinet sound like that. And then this instrument that I thought was so goofy became my best friend. Because it was challenging, you know, those adolescent years. I just said I was always odd. People were really mean to me, and I was a very sensitive child. And so um, the instruments and the music played, they were my friends. Still my friend, 30 years later. Still my friend. Look how it's blessed in my life. You know? There's not many black women clarinetists. There's many black women. Let me, let me, mm -mm -mm. hold on, let me correct that. There are many, many black women clarinetists, trust. Because when I was in band, it was only girls, like us, you know? So there's many, many, many clarinet warriors out there. Get them out. I ain't trying to be the only one playing clarinet. Get it, get the instruments out. Who, who was in band? Who was in band? Who? Oh, what? Wait a minute. Did you see how many fit? Did you see how, how, wait, who was in band again? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And then we all stop and we're like, well, I'm not good enough. Okay. Didn't say you had to be a professional musician. Didn't say you had to go on tour and make a record. You can bring out your instrument again and just play for yourself. There was a reason you were in band. We learned a lot of great things in band. We learned discipline. We learned how to work as a team. You felt that, oh, when you got a scale, you felt good. Those were like great things. So if you played an instrument before, just think about getting one. You can get a clarinet for 100 bucks on Amazon. Did anybody play clarinet? What? Wasn't it fun learning it? Remember marching band? All of that? You know, go back and just get it. Make it a part of your life. You don't, like, these expectations, that's another thing that I want to break in my, my practice. That's why I say, um, I didn't say it. I quote Avriel Raj. I don't know who Avriel Raj is. He's a, yes, you know, amazing percussionist in the free jazz community. He even played with Sun Ra. And he said, this is entertainment. This is entertainment. Okay, we're not. I'm not doing this to make a record. I got a record. Okay, great. That's wonderful. And I'm so blessed, so blessed. But the end result of your musicianship is not a record or a performance. It's the process. You know, like my I, my work isn't about the end result. It's about the little details getting to the next thing. It's the, it's a process. You know, and that's very disturbing to a lot of people because the process don't look cute. You know, like when you like the way I clean my room, it'd be looking like a disaster to people. They're like, Angel, what are you doing? I'm like, trust me, it's gonna look good. 
it just looks like a disaster right now, but it's going to look good, you know? Uh, it's the process of it. Now, with television, they don't show processes, right? On TV and stuff, they'd be like, okay, someone got a house. They didn't show them going to the office, filling out the forms, checking their credit, going to the bank account. No, they just show, oh, now they have a house. And so we kind of think that we live in that kind of world where things are automatic, you know what I mean? You know, there's processes to things that, that you don't see that are normal. That takes us back full circle to habits and practices and all this stuff, ritual, all these things you've touched on, um, and also to the name of this evening, In Progress. So thank you, Angel, thank you for, <laughs> thank you. for playing for us tonight. <laughs>